唱えよ創世合体Probably everybody knows that Shoji Kawamori is the maker designer behind most of the Valkyries from the Macross franchise. Probably not so many know that he is also the one that designed the original Optimus Prime, aka Convoy, from the Transformers or the Diaclone line. And probably even less know that he has been working on another big but not so well known franchise since the early 2000s. I'm talking about Genesis of Aquarion and its sequels, Aquarion Evil, Aquarion Logos, and the recently announced Aquarion Myth of Emotions. So, if there's so many entries in this franchise, it must have something going on for it, right? Well, yes and no. At least for me and for the first saga, Genesis of Aquarion. If I could summarize the premise of Aquarium, I'd say that it's Kawamori's big homage and modernized take on the combining super robot shows of the 70s and 80s, where, depending on the Gatai, the robot has certain abilities or advantages, a la Gete Robo or Lightspeed God Arbegas, all while at the same time trying to give life lessons to the pilots and dragging that too much before the story starts to get interesting. And believe me, it does get interesting for the final third of the show. Now, while Kawamori's mechanical design might be Aquarium's biggest selling point, and I just said that the life lessons get too dragged out, some of them are really remarkable human lessons. And everything happens amidst the mech action. I mean, they're very over the top and goofy and almost cross the line of being impractical. But if you are willing to put in the work and actually ground what it's being told, there are interesting lessons that can help you be a little bit more aware of the human condition. Big, big, big disclaimer here. If you are truly lost, don't look for life lessons in anime. Please try to go to therapy. Back to Aquarium. It may not be for everybody since the first two thirds of the show are mostly to introduce the cast and how they go from being completely selfish and separated team members to fully conscious humans who know their strengths and weaknesses all while fighting the angels. Yes, you heard that right. There are angels that want to bring forth something akin to an apocalypse or new genesis, depending on who you ask. And the only ones that can stop them are three or three vectors that can merge into different aquarium formations. If this reminds you of Eva, don't worry, at first I also thought that this was Kawamori's Eva, but it's not really like that. It's more like a palate cleanser between Macro Zero and Macro's Frontier with a little bit of Macro 7 enemy stats. And I say this not to downplay Aquarium, it's a good series in and of itself. It's just that we need to understand very clearly that with this new franchise, Kawamori was able to funnel all of his super robot sensibilities into it and keep all of his real robot sensibilities into macros. Well, mostly. Anyway, my name is Absa and it's time now to explore the first saga of Aquarium and how it's a show about robots and angels that teaches you how to open your human heart the correct way. And as usual, spoilers ahead. The story begins 12,000 years in the past, where the Shadow Angels dominated humankind until, in a fateful encounter, the Angel of Massacre Apollonius fell in love with Celian, a female warrior. This shifted the power towards humanity's side, and with the help of the Traitor Angel and the super robot called Solar Aquarian, humans were able to stop the detention. Yet it wasn't a clean victory as Apollonius lost his wings and the Aquarium was also lost. Many, many, many millennia later, a disaster called the Great Catastrophe reawakened the Shadow Angels from their deep slumber in the city of Atlantia. This caused them to start looking for energy or prana, not only for them, but for the legendary Three of Life 
that allegedly is going to bring back the Shadow Angels Paradise. The trouble here is that prana actually comes from humans that are harvested from the cities by cherubim soldiers and the harvest beasts. These bioweapons are immune to almost all kinds of attacks from human machines and the only proven way to stop them is the use of quantum shields that protect around the cities. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's mostly the same premise of the Proto Devlin and the Macro 7 fleet. Yet, just as the Proto Culture has the Anima Spiritia, Aquarian's humanity still has an ace up their sleeve. An organization called Diva managed to salvage three ancient but very technologically advanced vehicles Vector Sol, Vector Luna, and Vector Mars. These vehicles can only be piloted by people with special powers called the elements, and lo and behold, the three vectors are in fact the pieces of Aquarium, the same robot used to fight the Shadow Angels. 12 millennia before. Diva also discovers that when the elements attain a certain synchronicity rate, they can unite the vectors into one of three formations of the giant robot, and each form can be used to defeat the army of Cherubim. And as if by fate, during the elements' first fight against the Cherubim, they stumble upon 13-year-old Apollo, who seems to be the reincarnation of Apollonius, the solar wing. This theory becomes even more convincing when he single-handedly takes control of Vector Sol, gathers the other two vectors and merges into the solar aquarium formation and obviously defeats the enemy. The first episode is super dense with information about the setting and the mythology. We also get to see most of the most important players of both sides of the conflict. Yet, don't worry. The series spends the next dozen or so episodes explaining everything and not really moving that much forward the plot. But don't worry, the final 8 or so episodes are super, super interesting. You see, from the second episode to the 17th or so, the formula of Aquarium goes more or less like this. One of the main cast members is having a human problem, be it angst or rage or fear or something like that. Then Commander Genfuro, my favorite character, gives a ridiculous, almost completely absurd, borderline nonsensical message that obviously no one gets. A new enemy, here called the Mythic Beasts, appears. They sortie with the vectors, merge into Aquarian, fail, merge again, maybe fail because the second kata is optional, finally understand the gibberish that Commander Furo said, final merge, and Problem solved, enemy defeated. Yay! <laughs> it's obviously not that simple, and some episodes are better than others, but you get the point. In fact, let's go through one of the episodes that really caught my attention for being as formulaic as ever, but actually having a very deep human message. Episode 15 begins with a kanji for person right there in your face, and immediately we revealed that the Latino character and horn dog of the group Pierre is showing signs of something that can be described as a merge addiction, which is obviously a metaphor for something else, but let's keep this conversation PG 13. He definitely is succumbing to the addiction as all of his thoughts revolve around it, interfering with his daily life to the point of being useless for action. He goes so deep into the rabbit hole of addiction that his mental state can crumble if he merges one more time. We also find out that his girlfriend from his hometown San Jose is getting married to his brother. So yeah, that's absolutely weird and very creepy and it definitely took a toll on Pierre's mind. Anyway, he gets locked up in a cell for mental patients and almost immediately Diva is informed that San Jose is experiencing an attack. This obviously strains Pierre's fragile mental state. Anyway, the vectors launch and merge and every attack seems to fail against the mythic beast. Interesting thing here is that the Shadow Angel is a being with two bodies and one heart. This is important because it acts as a counterpoint towards the human lesson that my man Furu wants for the elements to learn. And just when it seems that the angel is invincible, Pierre has a breakthrough thanks to Furu's teachings. 
Remember the kanji from the beginning? Well, Fudo remarks that it doesn't represent two persons supporting each other. It represents one human supported by himself with their own two feet. He goes further explaining that the one can't fully get support from somebody else until one has completely collapsed and starts to lean on oneself and it is then when one can look for more support. This is actually a fantastic lesson that I really enjoyed listening to because, well, without getting too personal, in the past I also felt strange, not in a super dramatic or mega depressed way but kind of inadequate to say the least. So I kind of stopped exercising, kind of up the drinking and junk food consumption and even worse, kind of stopped feeling supported by my partner. Emphasis on the feeling part, since I was definitely getting support, it was just that I couldn't see it. And well, of course I blamed everyone else for my faults. It was until later that I realized that I was falling, albeit very slowly so it didn't feel like it. And add that to the fact that everything post pandemic is still half weird. So yeah, this was the perfect formula for the classic everyone is wrong except me. It's actually one of the reasons that I wasn't able to keep a consistent schedule for my video uploads. I'm a little bit better now and thanks to my partner I got professional help but the fact of the matter is that I completely fell down. And it is from down there that I finally realized my mistakes and why I believed them. But paraphrasing what Furo said, once you're in the bottom and realize that you're in the bottom, that's when your perspective can begin to change and you can finally start to move up. I won't bore you much more with my story, but let's just say that I felt that episode on a very personal level. Back to the series and just like me, Pierre also understands Furu's message and with a new fire inside his soul, he's able to merge once more and defeat the dark angel who kind of embodies the problem that two beings who are not fully supported by themselves may seem invincible, but in reality they are not. Cut back to Furo and I know that I'm cheering onto the wrong protagonist, but like a wise Buddhist teacher with his riddles and koans, he further elaborates that when one is fully supported and dares to extend his arms, he transforms into something great and illustrates with the Dai Kanji that means big or great. And my friends, this was absolutely stupid, but deep, dumb, but fantastic. This is really when I said, yep, Aquarian is no ordinary mecha show. In other words, come for the giant robots, stay for the life lessons. And even though I praise a lot the show, as I said before, not all of the other episodes are as nice as this one, and some of them are a little bit boring but never so grey and dull as the story compensates some of the more boring episodes with a couple of twists and turns that are very very enjoyable. But if I'm being completely honest, everything really changes for the better once we reach the final 8 episodes, right when the little angel Futaba is introduced. Having said that, up until now I haven't really spoiled the series since I haven't talked about the real plot. But now I'm going to talk about the final episodes, the character reveals and the final story elements that truly make up for the entire show. So if you have already seen the anime, please come with me, but if not, please proceed with caution as I'm going to talk about what happens, but don't worry, I won't say why it happens. So let's get this out of the way right away. By the end of the series we find out that Apollo is not necessarily the reincarnation of the solar ring, that brother and sister Sirius and Sylvia are descendants of Apollonius and Celian, making them human angel hybrids, that dark angel Toma wants to use Aquarian to fuel the tree of life and bring forth a new era of angels and in something that I didn't expect whatsoever. Sirius and Sylvia are two halves of Celian's reincarnation. This was an amazing choice that also added a new dilemma. Since the two siblings were neither fully human nor fully angel, where do they belong? 
Right from the very beginning, Apollo accepts them for who they are. But will the rest of Diva react the same way? This new layer of conflict has another fantastic twist that I didn't expect. Sirius decides to embrace his angelic side and defects to the shadow angel side along with his vector, leaving Diva unable to form Aquarius. And why did he defect it? Good thing for you to ask, so let's back a little bit up. Ever since the introduction of Futaba, this angel didn't seem to be truly bad, almost as if he was just innocently playing with his human pets. Now, the thing is that we humans can be very, very cruel. So once he was defeated, he was captured. Even worse, he was experimented with. This obviously was a very, very, very big red flag for the siblings. Diva is supposedly protecting the humans from the dark angels, yet as soon as they were able to get their hands on an angel, they proceeded to experiment and torture him. With that level of cruelty in mind, what makes Diva any different from the dark angels? Now, imagine if that same Diva learns that they also have two human angel hybrids. Will their fate be the same as Futaba's? That was something that Sirius was not willing to find out and falling for the temptation of Toma, he leaves Diva and his sister and fully embraces his wings. And if that wasn't enough plot twists, Diva scientists managed to acquire Futaba's angel wings and reverse engineer them to almost revive and transform Glenn, a former element who got injured on the very first episode, into a man-made human-angel hybrid capable of piloting and commanding the now viable mass-produced vectors. Two things here. This was something that came out of nowhere and it was fantastic. I said it before and I'll say it again. The final eight episodes of Aquarium definitely make up for it. And second, the unmanned Aquarium looks, in my opinion, much, much better than the Super Robot Aquarium. I really don't know if it's because of the more subdued colors or the fact that they don't have such a human-like face or maybe even that Kawamori has a style that favors more the real robots. I really prefer the unmanned vectors and it even had a Gerwak mode so that was fantastic. Also another thing super weird was the fact that Glenn was the head vector and the other vectors were piloted by angelic feathers. Super super weird. So. Now we're ready for the final battle. Toma and Sirius with the Kervin Vector Mars against the remaining Vectors and the Unmanned Aquarium. But the traitor is betrayed. Toma, in his eternal hate against the Wingless Ones, deems Sirius unworthy of being his companion and damages him in an almost fatal way. This is because Toma believes that he is the only one who can truly awaken the solar wing that can thus bring forth the new Genesis and revive the Tree of Life. We also find out that the solar wing is neither Apollo nor anyone else other than Aquarian himself. This means that the whole time the solar wing was there, yet it has somewhat of a combination key for it to be truly the solar wing. This means that for Aquarian to be able to access its solar wing formation, it needs the souls of a dark angel and a human. A true merge of the mechanical, the angelic and the humane. But Toma is not willing to give control to the mere mortals. Neither Apollo nor Sirius want to loosen up so the world starts to crumble since the solar wing wasn't able to restore the tree of life because of those things that were missing. But fear not, my friends, in one of the most absurd but powerful lessons, Mr. Furu, seeing the despair in Sylvia as she is witnessing the downfall of everything, asks her what happens when she unites her hands in front of her. Keep in mind that Sylvia is also half angel, so one of her hands is human and the other one is angelic. And yes, this is not metaphorical, she has wings in one of her forearms. This leads to the tremendous revelation of warmth. Two hands, two species, when together in peace, they can achieve warmth. Without warmth, there can be no life. With warmth, anything is possible. 
and lo and behold, finally the golden solar wing appeared and with its super super robot powers and infinity punch, it manages to pull together the earth and reignite the tree of life. But at the cost of Aquarian and its pilot's life. The winged and the wingless working together for a new genesis. And while conceptually super powerful, I didn't like it. I mean, it is very in line with the series, like a quite literal depiction of the solar wing holding together the earth thanks to the powers of humans and angels and everything in between them. But I don't know. I would have preferred it if it was a little bit more metaphorical. Don't get me wrong, it's a very powerful ending that hammers down its message, yet that doesn't mean that it's not silly. But then again, that same statement could be said about the whole series. Aquarian is a good series that doesn't shy away from delivering powerful human messages even if it means that it has to go all the way and embrace its silliness to hammer those lessons down. As per usual, I left out many details in order for you to experience the whole series if you're one of those that do not fear spoilers. Now, I really recommend it to anyone wanting to get away from the real robot genre and wanting something a little bit lighter. It does have fantastical mechanical design courtesy of Kawamori and even though I do not like the solar aquarium and prefer the unmanned aquarium, it is definitely a nice change of pace regarding the Valkyries. As for the complete story, well, I chose to omit the OVAs because in Kawamori's fashion, there's somewhat of a retell of the story seen in the anime with certain bits changed and some story elements altered or added or removed. It's something that Kawamori does in macros, yet here in the Aquarian OVAs, something super important happens right at the very end and without overhyping it or spoiling it, I didn't expect that outcome and yeah, it was very, very, very interesting. Kawamori played with the narrative in a very, very, very cool way. So yeah, definitely check it out. And if you're still here and maybe asking, why did I deliberately stop the little momentum I've gained by talking about the Gundam and Macro series by talking about something entirely different like Ultraman and Aquarian? Well, just as I try to explore the whole Gundam saga of Tomino, be it Universal Century or not, I also want to explore all of the works of Shoji Kawamori. He's a very prolific creator and aside from macros, he has worked on numerous mega shows. And even though Aquarian is not necessarily one of his best known works, it is a franchise that has a lot of entries, so that really intrigued me. That's why I decided to go towards the Aquarian route instead of Escaflown or something else. But obviously, don't worry, I will still talk about Macros and Gundam and all things robots. I also haven't forgotten about Idiom, so yeah, be very patient with me. Now, did you know about Aquarian? What was your favorite moment of the series? Please leave it in the comments and as you may or may not know, my name is Absal and you can continue the conversation over at Twitter where you can follow me at Absalonicas and on Instagram where I post pictures of my figures, my cats and sometimes even myself. I'm really sorry about the fact that the lights got out but well, that's something that happens when you're recording videos so yeah, please stay tuned to my channel since I'll be trying to talk more about anime, comics and maybe mechanical design via model kits. And Till next time, 
always remember that in fiction lies power. So let's use it to forge a new type of story, our hero's journey.